Um, I hereby call the meeting to order. This is uh, Thursday, September 10th, regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee. We have relocated to the beautiful media room of the Odyssey Middle School uh, due to the fact that uh, with the disabled elevator at the uh, Arlington High, uh, the usual meeting room is not handicap accessible and in order to comply with uh, uh, accessibility rules uh, we have moved to an alternate location. That's why uh, if you're watching this on television you're watching it on tape and not live uh, because we don't have live broadcast uh, capacity from this room. But uh, you will be around for everybody to watch on cable for the next couple of weeks. Um, with, it's with a heavy heart that uh, I mentioned that we've lost several members of the Arlington uh, school community and the community at large uh, over the summer, including Catherine Wall, Catherine Malatesta, Jeremy Kramer McNeil, a student at the high school, Christopher Blanet, uh Forty, son of Susan, uh, who works at AHS, and Nancy DiLoretto, mother of uh, Rob DiLoretto. We offer a moment of silence in their memory. Thank you very much. Um, we begin with public participation. Do we have a list? Uh, we're not in our usual configuration, so things might be a little awkward for tonight um, as we bring the list from the, the other side of the room. I remind folks that th there's a three minute limit on public participation. Brevity is a wonderful thing. Um, and uh, the committee will not act upon things brought to our attention during public participation. Uh, first speaker is Ted Wilson. Uh, Barbara Brandon will follow. Mr. Wilson? Yeah. Hi. I'm, I am Ted Wilson. I'm president of Schools for Children. Uh, we operate the Leslie Ellis School in the Gibbs building. Uh, we operate Dearborn Academy in the old Crosby building and another short-term program in the Central School. Tonight, in the interest of respecting your time, I was asked to represent Linda Shoemaker from the Arlington Center for the Arts, uh, Marianne Wachapi and Nicole Lowry from Learn to Grow, and uh, Deanne Benson from our own Leslie Ellis School. Uh, we've all been operating important programs and services out of the Gibbs building uh, since it was shuttered in 1989. That's 26 years serving thousands of children, families, and adults. In the middle of August, we were each alerted that the Arlington School Committee is facing a very large enrollment challenge. We were shocked to learn that you were considering solving this problem in part by taking back the Gibbs School when our leases end in June 2017. That was a surprise for all of us because it was totally different than what we had been hearing as recently as when we signed the most recent lease in 2014. We recognize that things can change, and we readily acknowledge the pressure you are under in trying to figure out what to do with your new set of facts. We want to help you find the best possible solution for the children of Arlington, and we want you to know how important it is that families and the children that we serve be considered as you deliberate. After almost 30 years, we feel we are part of the fabric of this community. Learn to Grow serves almost 100 Arlington families helping to prepare their children scholastically for our Arlington schools. Leslie Ellis School has a number of Arlington families enrolled, and the Arlington Center for the Arts provides programming in all of the arts, runs camps for hundreds of Arlington children and families every year, and touches thousands of lives annually. The representatives from the Kelleher Center are not here tonight, but they provide day habilitation and employment services to almost 100 very fragile adults many of whom call Arlington home. The possibility that we could lose the building we call home is obviously very concerning. So for that reason, we would respectfully request that the school committee put us on an agenda at the soonest possible date so we can share with you, A, who we are, and B, how we contribute to making Arlington so attractive to those young families you now see moving into town. We are part of the fabric of this town and believe the best solution to addressing the enrollment surge may be one which meets the needs of Arlington's children 
and which keeps the Gibbs community strong and vibrant. We appreciate the work you're doing and thank you for considering our request. Thank you. Barbara Brandon. <clears throat> My name is Barbara Brandon, and I'm the proud parent of twin first graders at the Dallin Elementary School. I've come here tonight, along with some other parents from the first grade of first graders, as well as on behalf of 53 first grade parents who have signed a letter that we have sent to Dr. Bodie. Uh, I've come here tonight to discuss the ch class size challenges that the current Dallin first grade continues to face and ask that the administration and school committee commit to solving this problem as soon as possible. Last year's Dallin's kindergarten class, now first graders, had 77 students, but only three full-time classroom teachers, resulting in an inexcusable average class of 26 students. The May 2015 district enrollment figures show that the three full-time teachers for our 77 students was inconsistent with other grade levels at other schools. There were nine out of the 11 cohorts that had 75 kids or more had four full-time classroom teachers. In fact, the report shows that one grade with fewer kids, 74 children, also had four full-time classroom teachers. Our Dallin first grade and the Bishop second grade, both with 77 students last year, were the only two grades with more than 75 students with only three full-time teachers. This is clearly unequal treatment. As our children begin first grade, our total grade level number has grown to 80, potentially making us the only class in Arlington with 80 students, but not four full-time teachers. The solution that was put in place was a half solution using a K-1 classroom. While this may have lowered the numbers, but from an appalling 26 students per classroom, the current class sizes remain above recommended figures for early educational, for educa elementary education, excuse me, as well as over first grade classrooms across the district. And what about next year? When the K-1 Band-Aid is ripped off, our children will be second graders with an average class size of 27 students. This is clearly not acceptable for second grade or beyond, so something has to be done. As parents, we are not asking for special treatment for our children. We are only asking for equal treatment for our children. We're asking that the class size be equals to others. And why is it that every grade level with 75 or more students had four full-time teachers, but ours does not? And why is it that the other class is stuck with multi-year early education, childhood uncertainty and the threat of 27 kids per classroom? All we are asking is that our children have the same educational security and quality as the other children in Arlington. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else under public participation? Hearing none, uh, we will now go to the opening day report. Dr. Bodie. Thank you. Many of the many aspects of the opening of school are going to defer until after our presentation this evening. But in general, I just want to say that um, Across the district, students are very excited to be back, as well as teachers. And that was said to me multiple, multiple times as, um, as I went around and, and met with students and teachers. <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, we did begin the school year with a lot of sadness um, at the, the high school, as well as Dallas. And um, th there was, at the high school, we prepared for that possibility for all of the potential uh, number of students who may want to have counseling, we prepared for that eventuality by having counselors in the building. And I think that, uh, that both students and teachers alike felt very comforted by knowing that that, that support was there. We also had um, counselors at Dallin on opening day. And uh, again, the feedback I had from the the Dallin principal is that that also was quite appreciated. So, despite the sadness, um, I will say that people, uh, students and uh, teachers alike, really rose to the occasion and were um, teaching, getting organized at the beginning of school. And I particularly want to uh, 
say that there's a strong appreciation to all of them because they did this in very difficult circumstances. All of our schools were very hot. The first day wasn't that bad because we, it was, it, the buildings actually had stayed relatively cool, I was surprisingly so, over the weekend. And elementary had an had a early release day. But I have to say, by Wednesday, the buildings were very hot, and we had fans going. Fortunately, last spring, the school department bought um, quite a few fans for the high school and the middle school, but they were going everywhere, um, and, and people were adjusting to the heat, but, but we, we did discuss with the possibility whether we would do um, an early release, but in discussion about that, the, so the consensus among administration was let's just go forward because we are, we are going to be able to do it and, and teachers uh, themselves said that actually the students weren't the ones who were feeling the, the hottest, it was the teachers. But they did a great job and fortunately everything is starting to, to cool down. Um, the buildings this year were in better shape than they have been in many, many years and I want to uh, give a lot of credit to our custodians, maintenance and our new director of facilities, Ruthie Bennett, uh, because they were, they were they were sparkling floors and very clean. And I have to say this is particularly challenging because every year we increase the number of uh, summer programs that we have, which makes the scheduling of the cleaning uh, more challenging every year. Um, both the middle school and the high school gave particular attention to the students who were transitioning. Um, at, the, at the high school, ninth graders met with together in the auditorium and they weren't expected to go immediately to their homeroom. Their homeroom teachers met them there and it was actually very cute watching the teachers having all the students follow them to homeroom. Sort of a similar, a similar kind of arrangement happened where um, students um, uh, were slowly introduced to the rhythms of the middle school on Tuesday. So it was a very it was a very smooth opening by all accounts in all buildings which um, is really a test to not only the, the staff of the schools but to the preparation that went into having the schools open smoothly and that's there's a, people don't realize how busy school departments are during the summer but if you lived on the sixth floor this summer you'd realize how busy it was and uh, so a lot went into into this and, but I'm very pleased to report that all is well right now. And there's more to report, but we'll get to that a little bit later in the, the evening. Okay. Um, if um, DRA is not here yet. They are oh, they yes, are here? Mr. Okay, yeah. we're ready to rock right, and roll. Me, okay. Uh, DRA report, go ahead. All right, let me Dr. give a little inter introduction. I, I saw Mr. Wooden. Oh, there he is. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, this is, I want to introduce Scott Wooden, who is one of the principals at DRA, who is who is working on the, the Stratton project. Um, is that might be better to have it come up here. Let me just give you a little bit of background uh, as to where we are with the project right now. As I think many people are aware, we we we've gone through a, quite a process in in um, bringing Stratton. To, the, to a level of equity, parity is the word we're using with the other elementary schools. Um, we have done some redesign of the building to increase office space, nursing, cafeteria, ca uh, cafeteria and the library space. I think you're all very much aware of that process. When we were last year thinking about where the students were going to go, um, during relocation, um, our analysis at that point was that we would have modular classrooms at several of our schools. In part, the choice of those schools was based on a couple of factors. One, the, um, the, uh, how well a modular classroom could be connected to the school, as well as the potential for those modular classrooms to remain after Stratton students moved back in order to deal with some of the enrollment growth that we're seeing at those schools. But as we've gone through the process, um, particularly this summer, and we'll, and we'll have much more discussion about this going forward, it became very clear 
as we looked at our enrollment growth and what the options might be for how to um, handle enrollment growth at all of the elementary schools, including Audison, that to make a decision about where to place modules next year for relocation with the, with the idea that they would be remain there probably could preempt other decisions that might be um, better long-term interests of the school district. So it was with that realization that we decided uh, to bring a recommendation to the facility subcommittee in late August about decoupling the um, dealing with thank you dealing with um, relocation issues for the for the Stratton Elementary with um, how to solve some of our enrollment growth um, challenges. That was that pres presentation was made to the facilities committee and uh, the, the recommendation was to keep all of Stratton students and faculty on the Stratton site during construction. And uh, we talked with um, our, our two architects from DRA, Scott Wooden and Carl Franceschi, who is not here this evening, about the po that possibility. Uh, central to being able to do that, they were going to have to change how they were going to do the work in the building so that the cafeteria and the gym would remain available to the school department during the course of the year with the work to be done there reserved to the following summer. And um, thank you very much for being so accommodating to make this work. But then once we could do that, then the next issue was how do we actually site these modulars to meet all the needs um, of the whole community. And this is, I think, where I turn it over to Scott so he can talk about well, the, you're doing pretty the good thinking. there. I thought you were going to take the whole thing. No, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're on. Think, t uh, explaining exactly how yeah. this will um, be situated, how the modules be situated at Stratton and what the project will be like, the timeline beyond that. Scott? Sure. Sure. Well, good evening. Thank you again for having us. We're happy to be here tonight. I'm Scott Wooden with DRA Architects. Um, the 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 plan, in in all uh, honesty, is kind of in its infancy. It's 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 a solid plan and it's well thought out. But um, we developed this plan pretty quickly when there was sort of a paradigm shift a few weeks ago from locating modulars at different schools to locating them all on the Stratton site. So. We're still sort of catching up with the plan and doing a lot of investigation on site. We've had somebody on site for the last two days kind of scoping out exactly what all the conditions are here along the edge of the existing building where we would be making the connections. Um, but we still do need to uh, go through our local review with the fire department and the building inspector. We're working closely with the companies that manufacture the modulars because these things, just to give you a little bit of a, a little bit of a background here, with modular construction, they're sort of a design build type of a type of a commodity. So when you're when you're doing modulars, you don't put together a, a bid specification like we do for a building where we detail every little aspect of it. We we give them a diagram that shows the layout that wouldn't be much further developed than this. We would show them some sections through some of the connectors, which are stick built. They're not modular construction. And we, we tell them that they need to connect to power, and these are the power requirements. They need to connect to plumbing and, and to sanitary sewer. And it's more of a performance spec where we're kind of giving them what our end product goal is, and then they put together the nuts and bolts as to how to do it. They would design the structural systems for it. They would, des you know, they would they construct, obviously, and they remove everything at the end. They restore it back to its original condition. So we're working with the modular company. We actually have a meeting next week scheduled uh, with one of the modular companies, Triumph, to, to review uh, the conditions on the site and to review our preliminary plans. We also have a meeting next week scheduled with the building inspector to review our plans with him as well uh, to show him how we're addressing egress, fire separation, things that will make this fully code compliant and safe. So our, our, the plan uh, right now is we, we, we came uh, upon a, a quantity of classrooms, a quantity of offices, and we've come up with this configuration. We've also designed this configuration based on uh, the need for um, uh, uh, toilet facilities within the modular so that the only thing that we would be relying on the existing building for is for cafeteria, for student dining, 
and the gymnasium for uh, a gymnasium space during the winter months. Okay, so what we're looking at here is this is kind of an aerial view of the it's a floor plan, an aerial view of the existing building with the modulars. So what we see here is this is the outline, this shaded area here is the outline. <coughs> now use your imagination. You gotta use your imagination here. Um, so this this is the existing building here. So these are the kindergarten classrooms up toward um, Mountain Avenue, and these are the these are the this is the um, current configuration of the parking area and the driveway, and this is where it loops in a little bit to the entryway to the to the existing building. So I want to make sure everybody has their orientation. So right now these are this is the hard surface play area, and then the grass beyond that slopes down. This is the ex existing swing set area and the playground beyond. So you can see. The way that this is nestled on the site is, is pretty tight to Pheasant Street. It's pretty tight to our existing parking area. So we just have enough room to get a sidewalk in here and a ramp and a stair up into the new modulars. And this is sort of an alleyway between, between the, the two modular uh, construction wings. So each one of these is a wing of classrooms. So what we have is we have classroom, 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 classroom. So it starts with the kindergarten here and the first grade and then the second, third, fourth, and fifth grades in the opposite wing. It connects here and it also connects back here by an outside connector. Okay, so most of your, this is an interior, an interior connection. So if you're going from uh, one of the special education classrooms over to one of these classrooms or into the existing building, the intent is to have that a full enclosure. It wouldn't be heated necessarily, but it would be a full enclosure and protect you from the elements, rain, snow, and and you wouldn't have to traverse outside to get what from one wing to the other. This connection back here is primarily made for, um, just to make a more efficient means of egress. That end of the modulars is quite high off the ground because of the way that the existing site slopes. So again, by these two connections into the gymnasium here and into the corridor that connects to the cafeteria, we'll be able to service the entire school's existing program requirements within that space. So the rest of the space would be shut off and would be available to the contractor for their construction during September of 2016 through June of 2017 while we're doing the construction. Any questions on that? You mentioned heat, so with the... Um... Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. The, the chair will entertain questions from the members. Uh, Mr. Hayner. The, the, the first grade and the fifth grade, the two rooms at the end, yes. how much square footage is different from the regular classrooms? I'm assuming no, no difference. Okay, so same that, area. It's the same area. It different just looks shape. different. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different configuration right. so that we can mm -hmm. get that corridor connection through the end of but the building. There. But this is the same square footage. Same square footage. Yes. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Seuss. Uh, so I just have a question. The bathrooms, I assume, are located near the building because they're hooking into the existing plumbing. Is that right? Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't point that out. But the the existing. Well, the end of these modular, and it, it comes just like that, right? They just bring, they have trailers prepared like that set up for, uh, there's utility space, a janitor's closet, and then a girls and a boys toilet rooms. They are, um, they could be located at either end of the wing. We did want to have them located at the same location on both of the modular wings so that we could get a, a clean line of, of the sanitary pipes, the plumbing and all of that, and the connection out to the street. And I think it's a little bit more convenient having them at this end because a lot of times they service the cafeteria and the gymnasium too. So if there, someone's in gym and they need to use the facilities, it's a short walk. They don't have to walk all the way down to the end of the wing. It seemed to make sense. So I, I just, uh, just a concern about kindergartners being able to use if, if there's a appropriately sized toilet or oh, appropriate sized toilet for a kindergartner um, available. If that's possible, it may not be possible. Well, I, you know, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's possible or not. Uh, there is a couple inches difference. You know, when you get down to pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, according to the plumbing code, there are these 
really, really low fixtures that are, um, you know, very different than what they are training on at home. That's always kind of a, a philosophical argument: is that if they're if they get that at home, how do they manage when they if they if they're using a 17 inch at home and they're using a 12 inch at school? There's a little bit of confusion there, but. I'll I'll um I'll take a look at that and see if that would be available. Dr. Allison Ampey. Well, I don't understand what's happening with the food service. Will there be hot food service? Will the so that's going cuz I don't see that being shaded in No, I, it's it's not. We would want to There's a lot of renovations being done in this area where the current food service is, is being delivered. So, um we haven't exactly worked out the details of that but we believe that there's sufficient space within that to segregate an area for the food service area so you do a temporary mm -hmm. right it would still be i think the intent is that we would still have the services that we have there now mm -hmm. that would basically be a warming kitchen and that things would be warm there and we would have a serving line but that could all be organized within the space without any special uh ventilation requirements okay um miss starks um, I'm wondering if there is or what we're going to do about a library. Um, we talked about that a little bit uh, in terms of maybe even having part of the cafeteria have a little space. And it may be that we will have to move the library books into classrooms. That is ex that is one thing that will be planned this okay. year. In fact, Mr. Hanna's here this evening, and I don't know if you've had some more discussions with your your staff on that very issue. Mr. Hanna, if you'd like to come to the microphone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Michael Hanna, Principal Stratton School. Yeah, you know, we've discussed both having that programming mobile, mm -hmm. um, carving out some space in the cafeteria, especially on the stage area, mm -hmm. um, that can function sometimes as an instructional space too. So mm -hmm. those are a couple okay. of ideas that we've had so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Going all along with that, art and music will be on carts and going into the rooms, I yeah, assume? Okay. For one year. Yeah. Mr. Pierce? The covered walkway or waterproof enclosure, any concerns about its, its, its narrowness for basically the entire two um, modulars <clears throat> to be using it all at the same time, say they're going into the cafeteria mm -hmm. or... Any crowding expected? No, no? I, I don't think so. W w one of the exercises that we'll go through is kind of right-sizing everything from an egress uh, code standpoint. But given that this is the common um, corridor width within their uh, module, which I believe is eight feet, and we're at at least eight feet for these, there may be some doors out of here, some emergency doors out of here so that you can discharge the grate. You don't have to necessarily go back into this building and go out one of these exits. So it still needs to comply with all the building code requirements in terms of uh, corridor widths, door widths, travel distances from each location to an exterior door. So we'll, we'll do all those calculations. We haven't quite done them yet, but we'll do all those calculations and make sure that's all compliant. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Have you, have we had any preliminary, convers pre preliminary conversations with the fire department or anyone about um, citing this and, uh, and any issues that they want us to be conscious of as we go about this? The meetings will be planned mm -hmm. next, next week. Uh, I know that's with the building inspector, and, and then we'll have to set up a meeting with uh, Chief Jefferson as well. So we haven't got any feedback we're, yet? No, no we're, okay. we're at the, we, we need to have something more, we need to have something to yeah. show them. Ms. Johnson? Um, yes, if I could. Um, this has already been presented to Permanent Town Building Committee, and Chief Jefferson is a member of that committee. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's seen this. In so he's seen it. Okay. And could, mm -hmm. could you just, was there any, what was his reaction? Was it, no he seemed issue? fine with it so far. Okay. I'm so, sure if he sees a problem, he'll say something. Yeah, I know. He's <clears throat> not shy. Um, Mr. Hainer, you're, no, you're fine. I to say the exact same thing. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Allison Ampey. Could you talk about how you would keep students from being exposed to construction dust? Asbestos, you know, stuff that's going to be yep. being stirred up yep. right next door. Yep. Um, in general, okay, we 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 do this frequently. We we there's controls in place. We carry a lot of requirements in the specification for dust control and indoor air quality management. There's specifications that mandate that they have to have benchmark levels before they start any construction. They need to maintain those during construction in the occupied areas where the students are going to be. There will be very um, uh, um, 
very well detailed and well controlled construction barriers at each of the points where we're where we're separating the two. So with with lots of uh, plastic enclosures, wood frame plastic enclosures, but also um, keeping this area negatively pressurized so that it's not pushing dust into the other areas. So those requirements will cover within the specification that we that we typically carry within these renovation type scenarios. There will also be, it's going to be very detailed um, sort of phasing diagrams but showing exactly what areas the contractor needs to keep clear and maintained for egress because one of the issues that we'll have here is that this will be a contractor area over here where they're renovating within the uh, kindergarten classrooms and this will be part of their um, continuous enclosement area but they've got to maintain this area clear because we need to have a secondary emergency egress we can't accommodate that on that end of the um, cafeteria so they'll have to keep a corridor here clear hundred percent of the time and we'll monitor that on a daily basis to make sure that they have safe egress from that from that area. We'll also show, we started to show here, there will be careful consideration and dates given that the contractor can uh, can gain access to these. Is that doing something funny? Um, is is gaining gaining access to this facade to do uh, renovations, window replacement, things of that nature on that facade, but then we want to move the fence in tighter to the building and maintain as much uh, clearance around the building that we can for uh, schools functions and school use and circulation. Um, Dr. Seuss? I just remember, um, it, do we have money in the budget to restore the fields when we're all done or is that something separate that we'd have to look at? Yes. That's definitely part of project costs. Okay, good. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. Sorry, one more. Just, and I think this one's more for Dr. Bodie. So how would student safety in terms of um, construction workers going in and out or, or keeping them from coming in and out be maintained? The, the, the construction workers going into the occupied space by students? Yes, how, how are we keeping the construction workers from, from just walking in? Or someone they're, who's not construction but pretends to be one. Somebody okay. puts a high hat on and walks yeah, in yeah, the building. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, there's not going to be access from the construction area into the school area. When um, Mr. Wooden is talking about the egress out of the cafeteria, that is egress out, not in. So that'd be like just That's an a emergency, crash bar emergency out. Emergency, emergency door out. Only won't yeah. be opened at any other time. Okay. None of the none of the uh, doors, or in fact, that'd probably be the only door. I think maybe there'll be one other. I'm not. Sure. No. no the, the contractors will be using the front circular drive. They'll be mm -hmm. coming and going through that door. Right. They'll be coming and going on the modular side of the building. So right. really, they'll be fencing. So the mean, only door is that, and that's an emergency, that's an emergency door, door only right. opening right. from that side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's it. And then everything else is divided off very clearly. Uh, I'll, I'll ask a question now. Um, uh, I'm sure the parents, teachers, and other members of the Stratton community and neighbors will have questions. What uh, forums and venues will we have to uh, give them the opportunity to ask questions and gain answers? Great question. Well, last night I sent an email out to Stratton parents, first of all, informing them about the presentation tonight. But I believe that we've, we've set up a meeting in which um, uh, Mr. Wooden is coming to meet with parents who want to come. Mm -hmm. it's, it's our regular PTO meeting um, in, on October 7th. Uh, there will also be a meeting with staff at some point. I would expect that as we move through the project, there will be regular meetings mm -hmm. that are set up. I, we don't have a, a, a time, mm -hmm. time frame yet. But that is going to happen. But in addition to that, you might want to talk about your advisory committees. Yeah, so uh, and actually with the faculty, it will be the day prior, uh, mm -hmm. October 6th, at our faculty meeting. We'll mm -hmm. be able to have uh, Scott and his colleagues present mm -hmm. and field questions and concerns. Mm -hmm. And um, even in advance of, of uh, the shift to this scenario, we had a parent advisory group meeting with me monthly uh, to share questions and concerns. We actually had a, a meeting here at the Audison when we were anticipating. Um, this being a host facility and mm -hmm. and so we're going to reconvene that group and this time actually with faculty as well so it's going to be a faculty parent mm -hmm. advisory group mm -hmm. who can then bring questions and concerns mm -hmm. to me and then I'll be able to work with obviously mm -hmm. Dr. Bodie and 
and, uh, mm -hmm. and Diane and, and the working group, and also as uh, a um, temporary member of the uh, Permanent Town Building Committee as well. So I'll be attending those, and I'll be able to bring then the, the mm -hmm. input from, from that body to, mm -hmm. to those meetings. Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize that school committee meetings are formal meetings of the committee, and we generally don't engage in conversation with uh, members of the public at a formal meeting. Uh, we're much more informal in subcommittee meetings, but we also want to ensure that members of the community have a chance to ask questions as well uh, in other venues or to forward questions to the committee when we consider the topic again. So uh, that's the structure of the meeting. I'm just sort of explaining, you know, what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Uh, Mr. Pierce. Oh, no. Okay. Mr. Hainer. I'd just like to make a comment that I am very happy that this plan is going this way, keeping the mm -hmm. Stratton community together. Uh, it's going to be a little tough on the teachers and stuff, uh, crowded and, and things on the cart, but I think it's much better than having uh, Stratton dispersed over the town of Arlington. Uh, I'm really happy with this. Any other comments or questions on this topic? Hearing none, thank you very much for coming. We look forward to seeing you again thank soon. You. Thank you. Um, Next comes the superintendent report, Dr. Bowdy. Perfect. Um, let, let me begin with enrollment, which is the first um, on that list. You received um, earlier this week um, our current enrollment, and this is even changing as we speak. There's been a number of registrations in the last couple of days and more scheduled. Um, what you will see here is that there are a number, not many, but a few places where the class sizes are larger than we would like. I think the particular place is at Thompson. We also have at, at Bishop at fourth grade and at Dallin at fourth grade. Mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the three, three class sites, and we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're working with the principals to provide support for, for all three of those areas. Now, what a week ago, I wasn't sure that we would be coming close to Dr. McKibben's projection for this <coughs> year, but that, that um, <laughs> thought has passed <laughs> this week. Wow. We, are, we are very much on track to, with his projections, and I would point out that what's important for you to note in that it's pre-K to 12. And there's a constancy of 57 mm -hmm. for the pre-K. Um, in fact, I think we might be a little bit more than that right now, but we're expecting actually that number to grow even this year. So, our as of the uh, as of what is the data? It's 9/8. So mm -hmm. that was a couple of days ago. Um, our total increase over October 1 last year is 162 students, mm. including pre-K. Pardon? Including pre-K. Not including pre-K. Okay. Not including pre-K. This, this chart that you received is a K through 12. Okay. And I think it's important to sort of note this because it's, if you look at that, Dr. McKibben's, mm -hmm. you, you'll see their number, which I think was um, 5,399 for this year. But that included pre-K. Right now, we're at 5,339. And then if you add in... Um, well, th that would be if I took the preschool away, what our mm -hmm. actual number is 5,313, and that Oof. is of a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. But what it was a little bit surprising is that it's really across the whole district. Um, we, we thought that our kindergarten was going to go over 500, and it might still approach 500. Mm -hmm. we, kindergarten doesn't start to next week, and there have been a number of registrations mm -hmm. this week. But it, it has been across the board. Overall, the average increase is slightly over 3%, 3.1% increase. Um, it's important to note that we're always going to be comparing to October to October mm -hmm. because there's fluctuations that go on um, all the time. And in fact, that's actually one of the challenges that we face in determining the number of classrooms. Um, even though we have uh, buffer zones to help um, even things off, what happens is that what might appear to be perfectly even class sizes can change, and then it, become, it gets to a certain point when it, 
the, our options really are not to add another classroom. And in fact, in some buildings, Thompson being one, there isn't another classroom to create another space. And that is true, really, in in quite a few of our quite a few of our buildings. The schools that have an extra classroom are the schools that are not necessarily have experienced the same the same growth. Of course, Stratton has extra classrooms, um, but at, the, at this uh, right now, that's not that isn't going to be very helpful in terms of the buildings that do need the extra classrooms. So, as as I'm looking at um, first grade, because there was uh, comments about first grade. Pretty much across the district, our range for first grade classrooms are in the 20 to 25 with an average of about 22.5. So it's, it's, it's a fairly tight range as compared to some other grades which have a little bit wider range. Fifth grade probably being having the most disparity. Uh, fifth grade can range from 19 to 29. And um, at this point, the, the, the best we can do is provide additional support for those large size classrooms. Um, the other thing in terms of just some patterns here, we have finally had a, uh, a milestone here at Audison. This year is the first year we, I think in a long time, that we are having a class over 400. The class, the current sixth grade is 424. And uh, the current seventh grade is 389. And then if I, if I go move into the high school, the high school grade 11 is 281. So we still have one class at the high school, which is below 300, and our first grade this year is 521. Mm -hmm. So you can see what the, mm -hmm. the range is here. But all of the class sizes in the high school are under 350. And eighth grade is as well, but then that's when it stops. <laughs> we're, 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 um, the last class under 400 is this year's seventh grade. Other than that, we're all in the 400s. And as I said, first grade is hitting five, is over 500. And that was one of the big surprises this summer is the, is the growth in the first grade. Um, I think, I think that probably had the most volatility. Um, throughout the whole summer was first grade. So we are growing. Um, we are growing at the projected rate. And at, on the, as somebody has mentioned, um, I think it was me, mentioned on the 24th, um, our school committee meeting is going to be held in town hall, at which um, we're going to invite town committees, the selectmen, to come and hear the presentation from Dr. McKibben about his methodology for making uh, the projections that he has, which is a very different methodology than what the school system has employed over the years. We use a straight mathematical formula. Basically, we look at the cohort of children that were born and, and what percentage of those children actually enter kindergarten. That percent has usually been over 80%. It's not the same students, it's just the numbers. Um, and then after that, the, the retention rate has always been high 80s, 90s. Most of the grades are in the 90s. And sometimes, if you look, looked at last year's, there were over 100%, which means that we're actually gaining students at that grade level. But the methodology is, is, is just looking at, is, is that basically is what we're looking at with having some weighted averages projecting out. Dr. McKibben's way that he has looked at enrollment growth is, is entirely different. He, not that he's just counting births, but he's looking at trends in terms of housing. Um, there's a lot of assumptions about what happens to housing when mm -hmm. interest rates are at a certain level, um, the economy, um, and trends that he see, sees nationally. I think what all of these documents, by the way, for those people who will be listening, they are on the school department's website. You can, you can look at them. Um, but there are some interesting things in his enrollment projections, which we'll talk more about on the 24th, and that is the age ranges in 10-year gr groupings in all of the school districts. And um, while we're seeing growth right now in, in the East Arlington part of town, 
what you can see in other parts of town is that the group <coughs> in, the, in the late 50s, 60s is l large. And what they find nationally is that in the 70s is when people start turning um, in moving, moving out of their homes and, and for, for a host of reasons. So I think it will be very good for the community and the school committee to hear the report, to hear the assumptions. Some members of the school committee have already heard um, his presentation, and I think it, 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 it answered a lot of questions in terms of the methodology okay. because we're going to be making decisions based on this. Yeah, let me stop right now because we've got the enrollment report on the table, and I know that uh, the members want to talk about it. Mr. Hainer. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the class size at Thompson, is would you consider, please, the idea of letting parents voluntarily uh, opting to go to another school, condition that they handle the uh, transportation mm -hmm. to bring, try to bring? It may mm -hmm. not happen, but I mean, class sizes of 29, even with an aide, the teacher then has the responsibility to prepare for the aide as well. I'm looking at the other schools, discounting Pierce. I mean, if you had just three parents, three families from either both classes willing to do that, it might help. I would be happy to make that offer to parents. Um, I suspect it may not happen, yeah. but I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. just yeah, the no, idea that to, to, mm -hmm. that we're concerned about it. Again, conditional that they be responsible for the transportation. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for us to have that added thing. To, 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 and I think you may have some parents that take it; they may not. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd add. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Thank happy you. to make that offer to fifth grade parents. Dr. Allison Ampey. No, I was just, I agree with Mr. Hainer. I think mm -hmm. it would be, I, I understand it's late mm -hmm. to be doing this and stuff, but it seems like something mm -hmm. some people might, it might be important to them and, and mm -hmm. let's give them a chance. Mm -hmm. um. uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, yeah, I, I third that, or, <laughs> um, especially for families who are new to the district, so that if they're new to fifth grade, and Hardy's a very walkable school from the Thompson, mm -hmm. most of the Thompson neighborhoods, um, that might be an option they want. Um, actually, I just have a question. I've heard through the grapevine, this may be false, that we now have at least one classroom that's at 30. Um, I was wondering if that, is that true, and are both classrooms at 30 now, or because of uh, somebody moving in? I haven't heard that. I talked to... Okay. to Principal Donato was just earlier today and she didn't mention okay. there was a change. Okay. That's what a parent told me. Um, and then, uh, and I know you're aware of this issue, mm -hmm. um, I wonder if we should reconsider our policy of um, allowing um, families who've been in the district but have moved mm -hmm. out of the area um, of staying through fifth grade. And I, I understand why families want to do that. Um, and <coughs> most of the time it works. You know, if we have 20, you know, we have three mm -hmm. to four families who mm -hmm. are no longer living in the district or in that Thompson fifth grade. Three. And w three, okay. And one of them actually is a friend of mine. So I, it's nothing against any particular, mm -hmm. you know, individual families. Um, you know, I had a son who moved in fifth grade and it was tough for a few weeks, but it was actually mm -hmm. ultimately really valuable for him. Um, so I just wonder, it's a great policy. It makes a lot of sense. But when we get numbers like this, we might want to reconsider it. It's been a very, like many of the grades, it, it has been volatile this summer. It, it, at one point it was not that high. And of course what happens is once you, igno once you um, acknowledge and offer that, well, the, at the request, and then you then a month later get another one, it's mm -hmm. pretty hard to say no at that point. So that is something that I think that we could reconsider. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that it's still a, a tricky thing because the numbers could change. And they did change. Mm -hmm. They just of all the schools, mm -hmm. enrollments are the most volatile at Thompson in terms of ups and downs. So they now it's up, <laughs> and now yeah. it's up, and now it's up, yeah. and we're trying yeah. to uh, do the very best we can. One of the things, though, that we've also put in, which I think might um, be event, uh, that you should know about, this year we received more Title I money than we have in past years. And we have taken the Title I money and, and put it into right. offering extra um, math and, e and reading support at Thompson. Mm -hmm. So there is going to be more support there this year than there have been in past years. Mm -hmm. we've, we've actually already hired uh, these tutors. Dr. Okay. Seuss, are you asking the Policies and Procedures Committee to look into that policy? Um, yeah, actually, I think it's a good idea. 
Mr. Mr. Pierce, would you put that on your agenda for the future? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Thielman. So I have two questions. One is that we received an email from a parent um, who asked us, asked if it's, if it's appropriate for us to revisit the buffer zones, uh, especially as they impact the Thompson schools. So I wanted to ask you that question. If that's, do you think it's a, a time to do that given the pressures on Thompson um, and on East Arlington in general? They're sort of in a, in a contest as which classrooms get larger. And, you, the, and so I don't know the answer to that. I think that down the road the answer is going to be yes. And it's going to involve, it's going to be dependent upon, or related to, I should say, the decision about what we do in terms of modulars or permanent construction at one of the, one or both the schools. So, yes, I and mean, I think down the road, honestly, we're going to have to think about mm -hmm. buffer zones everywhere mm -hmm. to increase them in order to create more flexibility. That, that's what the history was in Brookline mm -hmm. and Newton after a few years. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, get, we get a report on that in October, if you I will. recall. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the time to see if it's mm -hmm. okay. Because the thing to think about is, okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna begin to take a look at the buffer zones again, mm -hmm. what's the timeline for doing that? It takes a while. Mm -hmm. It's not as, or at least last time it took a while. It wasn't a simple process. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, well, we have new people this year. Hopefully, that they will be able to be ready for probably the last meeting in October. <coughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the overall conversation mm -hmm. about changing the zones. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yes. That 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 certainly will be challenging. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, and then the second question I have is, as you look at the uh, fourth, fifth, uh, uh, and third grades, and if all the way down, in the uh, elementary school, we're seeing that eventually we're going to have more than 400 students per grade at the Addison Middle School. And so you're looking at a school that's going to have 1,200, 1,250 students, mm -hmm. and, and we know that's coming. So. Mm -hmm. When, what's the what's the framework for the conversation about how to address the space challenges at this school at the Addison? Um, well, that's part of the planning. We know that maybe next year we can probably manage one more year, but beyond that, we need additional class space at, at Addison. So the question is, what is that going to be? When you look multiple years out, in seven years, we expect class si the, the total enrollment there to be approaching 1,500. That's a lot. And in order to be able to accommodate that, we probably need probably 20 modular classrooms. And can we, do we have the space for that? So this is all part of this bigger conversation. But would they like them next year? Yes. I think we can get one more year beyond this year, and then we definitely need modular classrooms. And then the other question, mm -hmm. there's a request that uh, Mr. Wilson made to uh, have a conversation about the Gibbs. Mm -hmm. Did you, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but we're talking about space, so that might be the appropriate time. Do, do we want to, how do we want to, do you want to address that? Just to go to a subcommittee, is that something you want to put on the agenda? You're the chair, so I don't want I, to. I, I think uh, it's my intent to, to maintain communication with the tenants at the Gibbs, and I think that uh, my reaction is that, that they are entitled to have a hearing and a conversation with the full committee. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, we're all going to have a presentation in two weeks about our space need, and everybody will be educated from that, so I would anticipate inviting the Gibbs tenants to a meeting in October. In October, not a, not a facility. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify that so mm -hmm. people are here, they can tell them that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Hainer. That meeting that we're having on the 24th is a public meeting for everyone. Oh, and, yes. and, and mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. reiterating, we should also invite them as well mm -hmm. to that. I mean, they're mm -hmm. they're uh, mm -hmm. they're a private business in sound, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it will affect will have an effect mm -hmm. on them. No, but they yeah. request us to make a presentation. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm yeah. and, and, and be on the agenda. But, so I don't know how. Yeah. Far yeah. But the chair just said mm -hmm. that the 24th meeting is going to give us some direction mm -hmm. for uh, so the I'd like them, I guess. For them to be there too to help with their presentation as well. Yeah, I would hope that they would come or at least watch the video. Um, I like the videos. When I was off the committee, I enjoyed the videos. I never came to a meeting. Um, it's a much more comfortable atmosphere. Uh, the um, the thing is, is that I want everyone to have the same set of information before we start engaging in a conversation, which is why I think it's important 
that we do the presentation on the 24th and then, then. engage folks okay. in a conversation after everybody has seen all the yeah. details. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, two questions. One, um, my understanding with the fifth grade is I wasn't sure it's an actual policy. I thought it was more of an informal practice mm -hmm. that we have continued. And so I'm wondering if it's appropriate for policy to be bringing it up or mm -hmm. what's the right? It's always appropriate for policy to look at that because uh, it's the set of ground rules that we operate by. And if mm -hmm. we choose not to make a declaration, informal arrangements can be made. But if we wish to have influence over the decisions that are being made by the administration, we need to give that direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my second question is more, it's partly for facilities, but we've mm -hmm. in the past few meetings been tossing around modulars a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, would really like to actually be able to go see one mm -hmm. that's been on the ground for mm -hmm. a while so we can see, you know, mm -hmm. we know how they used to age. I'd like to see mm -hmm. if they're actually aging. And I understand you want to get mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. to have the same information, but I, mm -hmm. that's a great idea. I yeah. really would like to see something so sure. if we can figure that out. Yeah, I've also asked that we have the opportunity to take a tour of the Gibbs uh, at some point mm -hmm. in the near future so mm -hmm. that if the superintendent can arrange for mm -hmm. one, taking a look at a couple of uh, modular classrooms that, that, that have been in existence for a couple of years, I think that's your request. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then to have a, a date maybe on a Saturday to go through the, the Gibbs, uh, we, we can do both of those things as we're thinking Great. about the future. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Just for clarification on the, the last thing, the modular units that we're looking at right now for the mm -hmm. for Stratton are, are temporary. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the modular units you just mentioned are for mm -hmm. multi-year, mm -hmm. would we're looking at, that's what you're asking right, for. That's the, fine, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other discussion under the topic of the enrollment? Uh, Dr. One, Seuss. Just one more point, sorry. Um, so similarly, I think uh, to Jeff's point, mm -hmm. or Mr. Thielen's point, um, I think we want to mm -hmm. be able to have a open discussion mm -hmm. with the rest of the community mm -hmm. as well and, mm -hmm. and create some sort of forum for that. And I, I know mm -hmm. we're not quite sure what that's going to take, but I hope we do the, October looks like the timing. I, I think that after we hear the presentation uh, on the 24th, we can then the right sort yes, of set absolutely. a course. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I know that this committee wants to hear from everybody yes. uh, and pr uh, provide plenty of opportunities for folks to think about this. We, we gain knowledge from talking to, to others. Uh, continue on hiring report. All right, we ask Mr. Spiegel to join us. Thank you. So it's been a um, busy summer. It's been a busy, uh, especially the last few weeks, um, with a lot of new hires. Um, although this started in the spring um, with new people who were going to be hired for this year. Um, so some of the highlights, and you have the report. Um, for our administrators, we have a new social studies director, a new early childhood coordinator, and a new high school special education coordinator. Um, um, we're still um, looking to um, hire a middle school special education coordinator. Um, the teachers, I think I left a number blank. I think as of today, we have 42 individuals who have been hired as uh, new teachers to the district. Um, that's not 42 FTEs, though, um, because several of those are part-time, um, mostly in art and music and phys ed and facts, to... Um, and tech here at the middle school to sort of fill in um, schedules based on the new elementary schedule change and because of the enrollment increases in the middle school and uh, elementary schools just to be able to schedule enough uh, sections of classes. Uh, <coughs> one, one highlight is we brought a position in-house as an employee that used to be in um, a contracted service is the teacher of the visually impaired. Uh, orientation and mobility specialist. We were able to hire an experienced person for that position. <coughs> um, like in past years, we continue to hire from within and hire teaching assistants who are in teaching uh, preparation programs in graduate schools and who have worked in buildings to become teachers in our district. We have 11 people that are um, newly hired have been teaching assistants or building subs. We also have people who we've hired who have done long-term subpositions 
more student teaching here. We also have um, at least one person who's returning to Arlington after having worked in another district for a few years. Um, we meet with everybody. I mean, what I've instituted for a few years is um, basically individual meetings with each new hire with HR to go over all the, the information on the um, salary, uh, insurance options, ethics law, fingerprinting, uh, orientation schedule, and, uh, and meet with them to get them acquainted with the district that way. I have a breakdown by schools um, and district-wide. Uh, we also have been really active in hiring teaching assistants, especially recently, because this is a position that tends to be uh, very volatile toward the end of the summer, the beginning of the school year. There's a lot of movement when teaching positions may open up in other districts, and teaching assistants who are licensed might uh, be able to get those positions at that time. Um, that opens up slots here. As of today, this is an update, we have 40 four new teaching assistants, and we still have a few unfilled positions um, to hire. So that is something that we are um, continuing to, uh, to look for. Um, as usual, we have a range of education levels of our um, <coughs> teaching assistants, um, but we do have several, six at least with master's degrees. Many are in master's programs, um, and really a lot are interested in becoming teachers. Um, in, in a classroom or whatever. We also have um, the after-school programs that continue to expand, very strong district-run programs at Hardy, Thompson, and Audison. We have five new staff members there. Actually, we now have six since this report. I think we just hired um, someone. Um, and they work 25 to 26 hours per week. The schedule for Thompson and Hardy changed a little bit this year because of the early release schedule and the, the, the elementary schedule. Um, but they're going to average about 26 hours per week at those schools. I did a breakdown a few days ago on our total number of applicants for all the positions we posted for 2015-16 positions. Um, and those, a few days ago, was 2,488 applicants. Um, that's through school spring data, um, and that's just on school spring. Uh, that doesn't count people who have sent in resumes um, individually or directly to principals. Um, and that's probably grown in the past few days because we've had other postings, we've had other applicants. But we, school spring tends to be the number one source, at least in Massachusetts, for, um, for teachers who are looking for positions. Although there are others, and we sometimes post on other sites as well. Um, we, as always, this is a busy time for the whole uh, district administration, teachers, um, and I just want to acknowledge that these hirings wouldn't happen without the principals, mm -hmm. the teachers serving on interview committees at the, at the buildings um, or in special ed department. Uh, the teachers have come in all summer to serve on interview committees. Um, we've had, uh, and all our administrators have been busy doing hiring all summer. Once it gets to the hiring stage, it comes to HR and payroll and the superintendent's office to generate letters and uh, our d data specialist to e enter information into our, our data systems um, and our retirement administrator for the town, the people who are in town retirement. There's a lot of levels of people uh, who work really hard to make sure that everyone gets into the systems they need to get into and uh, get on the payroll. Uh, Mr. Hainer. On, in the hiring, does the, when you get to the point you're interested in the person they, in a salary, do we give, uh, is that negotiable? So that comes in when they meet with me. Uh, if, on the teacher scale, if they're coming in as a teacher in unit, in the Arlington Education Association Unit A, they tend to come in at the, based on our salary scale, um, gives credit for education level, bachelor's, master's, master's plus, doctorate and years of experience. So I tend to give credit, we give credit, our history in Arlington is credit for um, comparable public school teaching experience. Um, and then we have discretion on private school teaching experience. So the, the variance of the number, I, I see a .2 is one number, and then I say a .2 somewhere else is a different number. It's because of where they came in. .2. A, a, a position, instead of being a full-time position, like .2. I've noticed uh, tech ed, 
uh, was point one was sixty six thousand three sixty four, and then down below, OT PT was five thousand two forty. Like that. My report, not yours. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'm looking at the wrong. I'm, I'm not looking at your report. report. Um, I'm looking at yours. You're looking at the financial, financial report. report. I, I apologize. Um, so yeah, so. People it, will come in at different, it will vary ver, um, based on positions. Some positions that are harder to fill, um, we <clears throat> can hire and tend to hire people with more experience who might come in higher on the salary schedule. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Pierce. How did we do on our diversity <laughs> <Yeah>. hiring? Um, <laughs> so I'll have the diversity report in October. I, I don't think it's as, as good as I would have expected. We do have a few um, hires who um, are people of color, but uh, with the numbers that we've hired, it's not, as, it's not been as uh, strong as I would have hoped. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Just a quick response. If you notice a couple of weeks ago when the city of Boston's having trouble getting, mm -hmm. maintaining the diversity. So, I mean, mm -hmm. they get to draw a little bit bigger pool than we do. I'm not defending it or anything one way or the other, but it's just an understanding that the... It's a challenge, and there are times when, I mean, there's so many factors that go into it. When um, sometimes the timing works out. I know there was a position that opened up later in the summer, and had to, we had to move quickly to do, get interview teams together, and it was, you know, bumped up against vacation schedules of principals and, and, and administrators and trying to get it together. We've lost some candidates in the process just because it's the way it is. I mean, people are in multiple searches and they may get offer somewhere else and they're going to take an offer that's sure um, rather than wait for something that might be a little more uncertain. Any other questions? Hearing none, uh, next will be some more professional development. All right. I can ask uh, Dr. Chesson. Meanwhile, as she's setting up, I want to acknowledge the flowers oh, yeah, in our places. Beautiful. These are locally grown by the Mononymy preschoolers, and uh, it's wonderful that they sent them Gorgeous. to us. And uh, uh, welcome to another wonderful year of preschool. One of my colleagues in Lowell um, is enrolling her daughter in our preschool uh, this year, and. She reports just how wonderful the, the folks at the preschool were in term, uh, and all the uh, preparation for entry, and uh, uh, they're very excited. Yeah, uh, one other little bit of good news. Oh, uh, and, and the pictures. We have pictures oh. of all our preschoolers oh. over on the side. Oh. And another little bit, bit of good news is that uh, uh, I was talking to uh, another person in Lowell who's active in, uh, in, in the sports programs. And they commented that they were at the Bishop uh, Field and uh, one of the other fields uh, off of Summer Street, and that uh, they said how nice the fields were, and they were appreciative of the work Arlington did to host them. So, uh, just full of good news tonight. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Chesson, you ready? Yeah, sure. We're going to um, just talk a little bit about what happened this summer and give you just a brief preview of what's going to happen during the school year. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk a little bit about the professional development, um, some expansion of technology, which is putting it mildly. Um, just tell you a little bit about the pro professional development that we plan this year. And uh, Dr. Brody already touched on this a little bit, but just talk about the staff supports that we're going to be giving to our professional staff this year. Um, so we had a lot of uh, professional development this summer. I actually have slightly more than this because some just came, the green sheets just came in at the last minute. Uh, we funded those primarily through two sources, two major grants, um, an AAF grant and the success grant, and then also through our operational budget. Um, pretty much evenly, although slightly more on the operational budget, and teacher days spent were about 786 teacher days. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see there the variety of uh, professional development that we offered this summer. I want to really emphasize that this year we, we surveyed teachers in the spring. Um, Ms. Hansen and I also did focus groups with grade four, and we really uh, 
selected for professional development, those things the teachers responded back to us that they needed the most in order to prepare for the next school year. Um, one of the number one things that keeps coming up is social emotional needs of students and helping teachers to be prepared for that. And so you'll see a number of the programs that we offered there. Um, the second one is the being able to meet the needs of all students, um, the diverse learners in the classroom. And so we offered um, a number of professional development areas around that. And then um, we would be remiss if we kept spending money on technology but didn't provide um, training for our teachers. So there was a tre technology ed camp um, that happened at the Thompson School. And what that is is that um, teachers will be asked uh, what topics that they're interested in and then when they come in that day they get to sign up for that and it's run by um, as, as most of this I would say 90% of this professional development is run and provided for by Arlington teachers and teacher leader capacities um, we had a teach a couple teachers that went to uh, Google boot camp and uh, we had additional training on power school some special events that happened this summer. We had our teacher leadership program kickoff. We discussed with the committee last year about how we had received a grant from the Arlington Educational Foundation to have a uh, develop a teacher leadership program and to really formalize that and to provide our teacher leaders because we had gotten feedback from our mentors again in the spring that there were certain skills and um, experiences that they wanted to have to become more effective. And so we had that teacher leadership um, kickoff for two days in August. It, um, we actually have uh, six teachers that are actually taking the course for graduate credit. And so they have continued to um, collaborate online since the the, uh, the two days. And so have other teachers who are not taking it for graduate credit, but specifically for those teachers. It's been really exciting to see the kind of comments that they have going back and forth. Um, all our new teachers receive a mentor. So we had a mentor training this summer. Um, we had new teacher professional development, and there was an administrative retreat. So again, the focus for our areas uh, is not only just professional development in the summertime, but also curriculum work to prepare for the year. We did a lot of work at the elementary level in literacy and math. Um, FOSS, which is our new science uh, program that we're imp uh, implementing this year uh, in grades one, two, and three. Um, we had professional development on that and also on the teachers sort of documenting what they were going to do with that. There was a lot of work in the middle school math curriculum, um, a, a, lot, a very lot of work in world languages. Um, we have some outstanding um, documented curriculum units in world language. They, they did an exceptional job. The ELL team worked this summer. There is very difficult to find uh, documented curriculum for ELL students, and so our ELL uh, teachers decided that they were just going to write it themselves then. And so they worked this summer. Um, and there was a number of uh, work at the high school. Uh, I think one is the most significantly is that across subject areas, they updated the research handbook that we uh, provide to our students at the high school level. Technology expansion. These guys, uh, the, the window is very short because we don't generally don't um, place any purchase orders because of the fiscal year until July 1. Um, and then we have to be ready for school. So basically they have about six and a half weeks to get 900 new devices implemented and in place. <laughs> um, we have expanded our one-to-one -one pilot that you heard about twice over the last couple years um, in the 610 cluster to now include all of the sixth grade and the one cluster that's half sixth grade, half seventh grade. Not only will the sixth grade students be participating, but the seventh grade cluster will also, that seventh grade part will be participating. Um, we have our initial implementation of Bring Your Own Device. We have 51 parents, approximately, who have uh, chosen to have their student bring their own uh, iPad. We had three days uh, two weeks ago and then three days this past week, and we still have onesie, twosie people left that we have to add to the system, and they actually are getting on our network. So those students follow the same procedures and rules and regulations as a school iPad during the day, but then they get to take their iPad home at night. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll see how that works, but right now it looks like it's going to work pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, we have eight teachers at the high school that have a, a classroom set of devices to keep um, in their school to use um, through a competitive go uh, grant application program. Teachers had to talk about what they would do differently, how it would change their practice, and how it would change student learning. 
We are replacing about 100 um, aging SPED student devices across the district. We're replacing the oldest iPads. It's hard to believe, but we have iPads now that are five years old in the district. And they're, uh, you know, Apple will tell you their useful life is three years. I want you to be assured that if we can get anything out of them whatsoever, we are continuing to use them. We just keep pushing them down to kindergarten, first grade, where the higher level of functionality is not um, always necessary. Uh, we're going to be replacing aging teacher machines at Stratton and at Dallin. Uh, we've expanded, um, because of the increased enrollment, the tech and engineering labs at Audison from uh, two to three. So we have a new tech and full-time tech and engineering teacher, and through a grant from AEF, we were able to expand um, that lab. Uh, we're expanding the CAD program at the high school um, to go from um, a simple CAD program to now what we call 2 and 3D STEAM. So there's, um, through the grant, grant we received from AEF, there are eight very high functioning and high powered um, digital uh, photography video stations at, in that room. Um, and uh, so students will be able to do both 2D and 3D because we have the CAD, we have a 3D printer. Um, and finally, we'll have an additional um, science laptop cart with probes um, that we'll be able to utilize uh, from our science department. <laughs> So professional development for the fall, this is just to give you a little sneak preview. We have about 150 teachers and administrators that will participate in retail training in the fall or spring. We will have five of those courses and one administrative course that will be offered here at Arlington. And then we have people, sometimes people chose to take a course that was closer to where they lived. Um, our teacher leadership program will have professional development sessions at least five, four times during the school year. Uh, our literacy lab, which you heard about last year, our lab site program will be expanded. Um, we're going to be offering blended learning um, book study groups, and those would be book study groups where teachers would meet uh, two or three times face to face and then would have online discussions. And some of the areas um, that we're going to be doing, um, Margaret um, Thomas is going to be doing a, a cultural competency uh, book study group. Um, we have a discourse in math group, uh, group for um, elementary and middle school and um, one that's in peer coaching. I know that we have uh, people that are choosing their books and also um, considering how they're going to structure their courses. So there'll be probably at least two more of those added. And then after school and early release PD will be um, offered it to uh, prepare teachers at the elementary level for the fuller implementation, I shouldn't say full, but the fuller implementation of FOSS for next year. To let you know, um, we feel like the demands on our teachers are great and our administrators, and so we want to provide them with more support. Um, we are so blessed to have two new um, data specialists on board, Jean Silowitz, who came to us from um, the Department of Education, and Mike Remy, who came to us from a school in Boston. Um, Jean will focus on state reporting as well as professional development for secretaries and principals around PowerSchool, and Mike will um, uh, focus on registration, enrollment, um, another state report that's about school safety and discipline, student achievement data, and professional development for teachers. Our elementary report card this, uh, will be integrated this year into PowerSchool. Currently, it's kind of jury-rigged, and we really want to get it integrated in there. And this will also allow our elementary specialists to enter their own grades, which is something that our teachers have been asking for for a long time. What was happening is the music teacher, the art teacher, the PE teacher would all turn their grades over to the classroom teacher, and that teacher would have to put all those grades in. So we're going to be setting it up so that those teachers will all be able to put their own grades in. And it will really, um, it will certainly put a little bit more work on them, but it will take off a, a little work on the regular classroom teacher. Um, we're pleased to have Tammy McBride join us as a literacy specialist. Um, she's going to actually be team teaching with several fourth grade teachers in the literacy lab PD program. And uh, that's something that we're trying out for the first time this year, and we're really excited about that. And also, in order to really um, cut down on the amount of time that students are pulled out of classes as much as possible, our ELL teachers will be incorporating push-in this year for the first time as well as pull-out services so that students get language development uh, assistance in the content area and also will allow those teachers to model ELL support strategies within general education classrooms. And I think that's it. Questions? Uh, questions. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So a couple of questions. Where are we on the retail? Uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, all, all the teachers getting 
taking the retail certification, are, is it going to be done by the end of this school year? Is that the? Is that it, the that's uh, our that's our hope. Um, okay. You know, the Department of Education has this erroneous point of view mm -hmm. that retail is between the teacher and the Department of Education. I'd like to cure them of that thought. So we try to help our teachers as much as possible. Um, and we, you know, we really have communicated quite a bit. Um, we offered to house two classes here, in, uh, full classes here in the fall and two in the spring. Um, the Department of Education did allow me to offer more classes and did allow more teachers to go to classes than we have in the past. The first two years, we only were allowed to have 60 student uh, teachers in the um, uh, both of those years, so 60 in each year. This year, if we have teachers that need the class, they're letting us um, let them register. They're not. There's no um, regulation on how many people can take the class. So to refresh my memory. The state said we had to have everyone take retail by the end of 2016. Yes. Okay, so we're. In, we're Ev well, everybody who has to take it. That would be a core core class. So someone yeah. who teaches math, science, social studies, language arts. Right. Yeah. Blended learning, are we, I mean, <clears throat> are we doing that in the district? You, and, and uh, we're starting it in the classrooms with the students, and we're definitely doing it with teachers. Um, we have a lot of... Um, what grade levels are you starting at? What, 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 what I know they're doing it in, in the middle school, and I know that there are some teachers that may not be doing it, uh, what you would call blended learning, but they are posting videos, et cetera, for their students to watch at home at the younger grades. Dr. Seuss. Oh, um, two questions. Um, I was wondering what sort of professional development, and I, I know it's probably in here, but um, uh, is around um, sort of this new push to have more, let's say, active learning, have more mm -hmm. sort of problem project-based project -based learning. learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot forgot the uh, the words at this point. Um, so that's one question, and then my second question is about the iPads in the sixth grade and whether it's our intention. I know, of course, we don't have control over the money always to move that into the seventh grade and, and have that follow those students. Okay, so I'll answer that one Okay, because that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, in the sense that, yes, I mean, there. I know I had a parent who said something about, uh, you know, trying to save money. If we were to save money, because there are parents that would, save money is kind of a misnomer, yeah. but if we were to be able to repurpose okay. some of the devices that we have allocated for sixth grade because we have parents that want their student to have their own device in sixth grade, right. then we would move that up to seventh grade. Got it. If we have sufficient enough people okay. at sixth and seventh grade who are willing to, you know, because we have a limited amount of resources within the district. We might want to spread the word about that because I think maybe parents might be more willing to buy it if they knew they're mm -hmm. really... I think that's a good point, and I have no problem doing that. <laughs> um, in terms of project-based learning, within content areas, teachers are having that professional development because project-based learning in social studies could learn, look very different than project-based learning in um, math. So depending on the subject area, there's more or less depending at, at this point. Um, I know that in world language, they have spent a lot of time this summer talking about that. Um, we have a new social studies director that I know is really into working with people on that, and there's certainly pockets of that within the social mm -hmm. studies, um, perhaps less so in, in areas such as math. Mm -hmm. um, it's science at the high school we certainly do and at the middle school we certainly do that and the new FOSS curriculum will also foster that at the elementary school. Uh, Mr. Pierce? Uh, just a brief request that I would very much like to meet our social studies director at a future meeting. If oh sure, possible. absolutely. Get, yep, get we can definitely do that. Yep. Okay, great. Yep. Dr. Allison Ampey? I was looking through the pages and pages of PD that offerings and I came across what's the difference between a literacy mentor and an ELA mentor? A literacy, mm -hmm. a literacy mentor is probably a person who, I, I, I'm not sure wh how that was listed there. So off the top of my head, um, there are mentors at the elementary school for reading. Mm -hmm. There are mentors at the elementary school for writing. Mm -hmm. um, at the middle school and high school levels where the teachers teach ELA, there would be a mentor for, EL, uh, for that teacher in ELA. So I'm not sure exactly which item on the professional development okay. thing that you're looking for, but that would kind of be, clarify that. Hainer. The issue of providing your own device, I know when we provide it, we have the ability to monitor uh, the usage and stuff. And do we have that ability with bring your own device? Um, if, if you're talking about what websites they go on, right. okay, they can, they, the web, they, the, the Wi-Fi that they access is our Wi-Fi, and the, so therefore so it has the same can, filters. When we configure it, it limits it to just whatever we'd have in the school as well. Yes. 
So if they went home, they couldn't go off and do their own thing. At home, they can do whatever they want because they're on their home network. But when they're here, they're on our network. Is there any possibility that some of home can come into the school with them? No, it's sort of like if you have your, uh, if you have an iPad and you're at home, you're using your router and your thing at home, and then you go down to Starbucks, you're on Starbucks, you can't that. access your home at but Starbucks. But I can save something from home and bring it to Starbucks. Can they do I mean, that? Can you, can, you, can you save something? Sure, you can save something. Okay. They're, they're, I mean, it's we... It's not uh, absolute, I understand. Right, I'm however... Just, I'm just concerned possibility of somebody doing something inappropriate. inappropriate inappropriate with stuff that they bring to school right it would have to be like pictures or a file you couldn't right. access a website that no, you had right that. okay they're limited because in the, in the that it's true and someone yeah. could bring a hard copy photograph to school as do well we, well mm -hmm. do we have the ability to monitor the usage do we have the ability yes do we have the time and the personnel to watch every single thing a student no, does the, that. the answer to that if question is no a, an inkling they could Thank you. Uh, however, no, I, I actually want to clarify that one of the first things, I, have, I had an email from a parent that said their child brought their iPad to school all this week and they haven't used it yet. Well, today was the first day that they started talking about appropriate usage, and they spend three or four days talking about appropriate usage and what happens if you don't use it appropriately um, before they even start the kids using it. So I think that's the important point. I think the other important point is that we're now getting students who come up through the district from K through 5, and they're very clear about what our appropriate youth policies are. Thank you. Mm, okay. Does that include our technology report? It, I think yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. we now have the summer capital projects. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane Johnson. Diane Johnson. And I'd say the first item on the agenda is probably the elevator. <laughs> Yes, the elevator um, is dated back to the renovation of the high school, which was in the late 70s. And when it, it basically failed, it's a pressurized um, piston system, and the containment f that held the pressure of the, the lubricant failed. The metal just crumbled. And so no matter how much we poured in, it just leaked out again. So um, the parts are not available anymore. This is too old a device. And so they are remachining the parts for us. And then they will make the repair. We were able to receive an emergency uh, waiver from DCAM so we didn't have to go out to bid. And so it's moving forward as fast as humanly possible. But given the fact they have to machine the parts, there's no finite timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Thielman. The money, the 88 thousand dollars to repair this or eighty thousand dollars where where is that coming from well if we have a good snow year I'll squeeze it out of the general fund if we have a bad snow year it'll come out of our um, building rental reserves got it thank you mm -hmm. just going on that I noticed in the, I was going to ask in the tracking report we had we had already budgeted forty thousand dollars for repairs no those are for ongoing maintenance and contract services for all the elevators in the district oh thank you mm -hmm. I was hoping <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, there's some money in there for repairs, but when you blow a piston, <laughs> No, no, I understand. I didn't know done. if we could offset the, I forget if we have other elevators besides the one in my high school. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, I know we spend a lot of money on duct tape to keep the high school running, but I think <laughs> this is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is extraordinary. Yeah. And, you know, when in my previous district, when we blew elevators, it tended to run around $40,000, so I was pretty shocked. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about it, most elementary schools aren't six stories tall. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're just a different piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So the cost of replacing the whole thing, I mean, this is just going to be parts. It's going to be just as ugly and groany as ever. Uh, hopefully not as groany, but certainly as ugly. Um, is about two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars to do a whole new one. Mm -hmm. wow. Which if we're going to change out the building, right. yeah. it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Um, um, on more positive notes, mm -hmm. we did accomplish some things this summer to um, move us towards a good start to the school year. Um, Dr. Bodie already talked about the fact that, you know, with our new management team for maintenance and custodial, that things are going really well. Um, we finished the Harding building repairs, um, the water mitigation project that's been going on for several summers. That is now complete, and so we should have a reasonably watertight building for the next 10 years. Apparently, brick becomes more porous with time, and it needs something, okay, I'm at the end of my technical knowledge, like a laminate that goes over the outside to keep the water from seeping in, and that has to be renewed. Um, that had not been done from the time the Hardy was refurbished, 
and so there was damage. And so this wasn't just, it wasn't as simple as putting a coating on it, it was fixing all the things that had rotted. So the bricks were repointed, the grouting was redone, and then it was laminated. But now we know that it'll be in our maintenance cycle, and so in 10 years before there's damage, we can relaminate it. I'm sure that's not the word. I'm going to find out tomorrow what the real word is. Seal. Um, we opened up a new tech lab. There was some mild construction work that was done um, to get that online. It was a little last minute, but we got there. Um, we've put in new floor mats at the entrances to each school in the district. Now, this doesn't sound like a big deal, but it actually is a big deal because it really cuts down on the tracking filth in the building and the wear on the floors. So since many of our buildings are recently redone, these new floor mats are going to go a long way to help keep the floors good for a longer time and certainly making it much easier on the custodial staff to keep them clean. Um, the Thompson School has some unfortunate drainage problems that you may or may not have been aware of and that involved tearing up the floor in the lobby to get at the drainage system. There's been a repair done, but unfortunately it was done over the summer when we didn't have the full contingent of students in the building using the plumbing to really test it thoroughly. I mean, everything could be flushed simultaneously, but it's just not the same thing. So we need to see. So we haven't re refinished the floor topping yet because we want to see that this, this fix holds. If it doesn't hold, we'll be back at it next summer and digging up a much bigger hole. Um, but if it does hold, then we'll repair the floor. At, at some point, we will get it fixed, however, whatever we need to do, and then we'll finish off the floor again. Mr. Pierce. This is new. Any warranty? <laughs> <laughs> How did this happen? We just so missed fast. it. it. Well, it doesn't, you know, it's one of those, you know, you hear that knock in your car, and then you don't hear it, and they bring it to the garage, and they don't hear it. It was one of those problems. It would back up, and then it would work fine. And, you know, oh, somebody threw something down there, and then it would be fine for a while, and then it would back up. And so it was just not... It didn't, it didn't fail every single time. That's easy to out. It was kind of intermittent. But then it, it developed a consistent intermittent pattern. And so at that point, it was like, okay, wait a minute. Something's amiss. Well, th is there coverage for new building creation? It's I a mean, year. It's just a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the contractor mm -hmm. is playing ball. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want this kind of a record at DCAM no. saying, yeah. you know, yeah, they put in a system that right. backed up, and right. then they didn't do anything about it. So they're, they're working with us. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. good. So, you know, they've affected the initial repair. We've had not one, not one second opinion, but two second opinions mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And it's basically one of those things. I mean, definitely the repair that was done helped the situation. Mm -hmm. But whether it's the total cure, if, in fact, it, mm -hmm. the pipe is supposed to run at an angle with gravity. And there was, a, there was a dent in it that they think was an accident that heavy equipment rolled over it in between when gravel went down before the floor was poured. And so they dug a hole here and straightened that out. If that's the problem, we should be all set. If, however, this angle wasn't installed properly, if the angle really needed to be like that, and that's the problem, we're going to be back at it. We're going to have to dig a much bigger hole to change that whole pitch of that pipe. So that's what we're waiting to see. And that's... Dr. Allison a, Ampey. Sorry, that's just a year of warranty because that's clearly defective. I mean, if, if it is that problem, that's defective construction. Yes. I mean, and the, the contractor is working with us so far, mm -hmm. so we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And we're all holding our f fingers crossed that that, that that was the problem, not mm -hmm. that. Right. But there's no way to know until we know. Okay. Yeah. Um... So that was good work that was done. Um, we built a new registration office in the central lobby of the high school. And one of the big problems with parents coming in to register is very difficult to find the old registration office. And so now you can come, you can direct people to the pillars. You walk in and you'll see it immediately to your right-hand side. And this is creating a little excess traffic for them at the moment. They're kind of becoming a lobby, and that's mm -hmm. not really what we want. But we'll work out the kinks, and I think it's a much better location. It's not quite finished yet. There's going to be a counter. Um, and some other construction work, but at least they have cubicles now, and, and we're getting there. Um, there was painting done at the high school, the Dallin and the Audison over the summer. The high school locker rooms were partially painted. The Pierce Field turf was replaced, and that was a very good thing. Um, all the schools now have uh, carbon dioxide detectors. That was a new requirement in code, and that was done over this summer. Carbon monoxide? Carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide, you're right. I put dioxide. <laughs> that, that'd be going off. Of <laughs> My bad. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we have to put plants everywhere to keep it. 
Um, new public address system was installed at the Hardy, um, which now has uh, some interesting features. I guess formerly at the Hardy, when they made an announcement, everybody outside heard it as well as inside. And so now that's cured, that, that it can be differentiated. The gymnasium floors at the Brack and the Audison were refurbished. Electric power distribution was added to the freshman building of the high school to support the new technology rollout. Um, you may not think about this, but when we roll out these devices, there's a ripple effect, mm -hmm. and, and many schools were not designed mm -hmm. to support this kind of elect electronic mm -hmm. drain, and so we've ha we had to do some infra infrastructure work at the high school to make that work. We've completed the mounting of projectors to the ceilings in the classrooms at the Bishop School, and we're still in process at the Audison and the Brackett schools. Um, the solar arrays are in the process of being installed at the high school, Audison, Thompson, Pierce, Stratton, and Dallin schools. And the energy credit we receive will come back to our budget. And so oh, it will be an great. offset oh, against really? our electric bills. Oh, okay. So that may pay for our elevator if all goes well. So <laughs> I'm kind of curious. You went to the unveiling? Yeah, with Mr. Hanner. Yeah. Cool. We, we uh, wore hard hats. And well, he got to wear the hard hat. Oh, I, I, I wore the hard hat and the vest. And mm -hmm. it was really amazing how they do it. They explained what goes into it and the big boxes that mm -hmm. came with all the arrays and it was it was a nice morning mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, um, bishop has a new energy management system which is new to the bishop at some point we mm -hmm. hope to be able to have all of the all of the schools in the district on an on an ems system that can be controlled from you know one of the director's computers so mm -hmm. that for example today when we were trying to get the air conditioner higher in this room I was on the phone to the superintendent of buildings, Mark Miano, and he was able to adjust the temperature from his uh, from the comfort of his home. Um, and if you go to that part of the library, you can feel that he really did. It's just not quite filtering over here, but it's nice and cool over there. Um, then we want to be able to do that for the whole district because at some point uh, there are systems that, it, that already exist that you can integrate a scheduling system with the energy management system. So you could literally turn the heat on in a room for the rental period and then turn it off as they walk out. Mm. Uh, same thing with lights, mm -hmm. you know, they could all be handled, that there's no question that it be left on. People can check it from a computer and mm -hmm. shut it down or turn it up. Um, domestic hot water at the Audison is being replaced with a more energy efficient model. Exterior lights at the high school are being replaced with LED lights, high efficiency LED lights. Um, the IT department has a brand new cooling system and was able to consolidate all their servers down in the basement of the high school. Uh, they were unable to do that previously because um, servers throw off a ton of heat and without appropriate cooling they can go funky and then we all be very sad. So they have the cooling system in place and they've, they've completed that switch. And Dallin, Brackett and High School um, exterior grounds were given quite a bit of attention with some tree pruning and some other, some other heavy work. Um, it's a lot. And just, just like the IT department has to flip out the new, um, the new inventory, the, the maintenance department pretty much has from the day the kids walk out until they're walking back in to get all of this done. And they're working around summer programming. So they've just done a tremendous job. And I'm really grateful to the work they've done. Hardy. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Hardy. Mr. Hainer? Well, you may be asking, yeah. anticipating <laughs> my question. The Heidi Playground? She was indeed. Um, the bids have come in, yep. and we have selected a, a low bidder, and the contract will be hopefully going out tomorrow. Um, but I need to I need to talk to the contractor about what the construction schedule will be, and so once that information is known, I'll disseminate that. I just like to just a couple of minor quick fixes. Those benches they're composite, and when they break, all th all three of them have a break. There's very sharp edges on them. We had um, caution tape around them. It wasn't there this afternoon it's, when I went it's by. It's disappeared again. Well, okay. I mean, okay. And uh, mm -hmm. two of the, for a better phrase, cargo nets the kids climb up yep. on, they're broken. And uh, either the fix may not be appropriate mm -hmm. right now to take it down. It could could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. I'm just concerned about that. There's a swing that's mm -hmm. flipped over the top, but if you can get up there, you, you're already in trouble. The, the mm -hmm. delay, part of the delay in the Hardy Playground was that this summer when we were looking at relocating the Stratton to various sites and we were considering the possibility of permanent modulars rather than temporary modulars, one of the likely sites for a permanent modular was at the Hardy. And in fact, smack in the middle of that play structure playground was mm -hmm. a likely location, in which case I didn't want to spend what, what was estimated to be a $60,000 for something that was going into a dumpster. And so we delayed until that became more clear that we weren't going in that direction, and then it went out mm -hmm. to bid, and now we're moving forward again. Would, 
when you determine the schedule and stuff, mm -hmm. could you get that out to the the, mm -hmm. the Heidi parents? Absolutely. Stuff? Because yeah. I've been in contact with the principal De Francisco Great. about this. Thank so you. We'll keep that moving. Ms. Starks. Um, I was wondering uh, if you have an update on the track. I know that there was a possibility of fixing that as well. I know it was a timing issue. That we did get the bids mm -hmm. in. We have one bidder. Um, the mm -hmm. bid came in for twenty thousand dollars more than we have left in the mm -hmm. capital budget from doing the turf. The other concern about moving forward with it at this time, other than the money, which given the elevator is a concern, is the fact that the Pierce Field seems to be a magnet for usage. When we were trying to install the turf and we had signs up saying stay off the field, we couldn't keep people off the field. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we couldn't keep people off the field. People would take the signs down and use the field. Uh, you know, we would lock the gates and they would unlock the gates. They, you know, we, we would have signs up everywhere and people would walk right past the signs and use the field. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very concerned. When you lay down a new track, you need five days for it to cure mm -hmm. where there can be nothing on it. And it's very difficult to imagine at this point how we could possibly keep those, that track clear so it could solidify. We are planning to implement a um, series of positions of uh, field managers, the people who will be hired by the school department to monitor activities on the field for tenants that come and go. And you know, just like we have a custodian in the building when we have a detail, we will have this, this person or persons because there's a lot of hours the field's in use. I doubt one person would want all those hours um, to monitor the field. I think it would be very beneficial to hold up on the track until we have that in place to help shoo people off the field because based on what we saw over the summer with the turf, I'm really concerned. You know, to, to spend $100,000 on a track only to have it gummed up. You know, people, people were still using, you know, we couldn't stop them. It was amazing. I Mark threw, I mean, Mark was seeing people scaling the fence. And it was just like, wow. I don't know what it is about that field, but people just cannot stay away. Wow. So, you know, that's a real concern about the track. So yeah. we're also rapidly losing our window. It has right. to be done by the end of this month if we're right. going to do it. And there's no way we're going to have those positions in place to monitor the field. And I'd be, and plus, the fall is one of the most busy times for the Pierce Field. And trying to explain to everybody who comes to watch a football game that you can't touch the track, I worry. So We did some patching of it back in the spring. So there's been patching on the track. It's not clearly just a Band-Aid in the most worn areas. But we, you know, it's not, I think we've pretty much decided to defer this, but we're not 100% there. Right. We still have okay. another, but I think that that's where we, we're coming down. It has been submitted into the capital budget, so oh, okay. that we will, you know, we will return the balance of the Pierce field, of the turf, yep. and then request, and the differential would be pretty much all they'd be adding on. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're, we're set to go forward for next year. Oh, okay. In which case awesome. we would put the track down in July, hopefully with people to babysit it right. at a time when it's less used. Right. Um, and my last question is uh, Spy Pond Field. I found out today uh, that that is mm -hmm. the property of the Park and Rec Department. Oh, the whole thing? <laughs> yes. Ooh, even the stands and yes. the mm -hmm. oh, locker yes. rooms the, um, and all that. Oh, all right. that. The, um, the DPW director has done some research on it, and the initial estimates for repairing those bleachers are extremely high, yeah. somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred dollars to $800,000. Mm. And yes. Um, they got to do something because they got a beautiful set of tennis courts across the I way. I know now. that yeah. was yeah. pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, you know, what's what's ultimately going to happen? It's certainly part of the capital discussion. I mean, there has been some ambiguity about who exactly mm -hmm. owned the field, but, but it now is. Now we know. But now we know. Okay. So you know that that's where that stands. Cool. Thank you. Uh, do we um, use uh, Thorndike at all for athletics? That belongs to Park and Rec. But do we use it? I think we do some practices there, but that's mm -hmm. about it. It's not that I think goes down mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Allison Appy. Um, going back to Spy Pond, if we're still using it as a field, I understand it belongs to um, the rec department, but if we're using it, can we direct any spectators, like if we're using it for a game, direct spectators not to use the bleachers so that I think if we don't, we're potentially liable if there is any injuries, even though it's not our field because it's our game and, and we're having people there. But I think if, if we just have signs up saying, don't, you, you know, don't use the bleachers, they're unsafe, that well, that might be enough to do, at least that would help. 
Well, Capitol starts convening in a week from tonight, so mm -hmm. I'll certainly bring those concerns up. Well, I mean sure. that we should be doing, you know, if we're going to a game, if, if they're having the game on site, we need to see that there is some sort of sign on the bleachers mm -hmm. saying, don't use these. Would that Mr. Hainer, the liability goes to the town, even though it might come through us. I, I appreciate yeah. that. And, and mm -hmm. uh, the rec belongs to the town as well. Mm -hmm. The town, maybe, maybe through the superintendent, uh, just asking town council uh, to put some sort of, to prevent mm -hmm. that issue, just to uh, have a sign put up or something mm -hmm. by whomever yeah. to cover us, cover us all. Uh, one last question. The Arlington High exterior lighting, mm -hmm. Uh, is this being installed in compliance with the town dark skies bylaw? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but um, Ruthie Bennett, who was the energy manager who did the grant to get this lighting done, mm -hmm. um, and is now the facilities director, mm -hmm. um, works for both town and school. So mm -hmm. I'd be very surprised that she was. We should be unaware mm -hmm. of that. But I will. I will inquire. Yeah, Mr. Hainer. I'd like to piggyback on that. I've had quite a few conversations with uh, tenants in the apartment house, the lighting of the basketball court, prior to the apartment house being there, went off at 11 o'clock. It, it had no effect on anybody. Kids would stay out there, and they stay out there till 11 o'clock. The lights need to go out at a reasonable time. During school, 9 o'clock, weekends maybe a little bit later. But uh, the language and stuff that kids, in, they've told a couple of senior citizens to stick it in their ear, and they weren't mm -hmm. that polite. Uh, it's really bad, and uh, the seniors have gone to the police. The police says, we own it, talk to the school department. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. th that basketball court has undergone a change because of its proximity to the new apartment facility right there. Mm -hmm. I would ask us mm -hmm. to consider shutting them off at 9 o'clock. Well, this, this is a conversation I need to have with the police department mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. together we agreed that this would be a place that students could come, that Police would be monitoring it, and um, but of course there's also the issue: Do we really want students lingering by the high school period? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a it's a conversation that we need to have, and we Thank will. Um, that involves certainly the tenants there, but also just a bigger issue of, of kids being behind the high school. Several of the people there approached the owner to ask him if they could buy that piece of land, and I said, I doubt <laughs> if we're going to sell any land right now until we get the high school done. So. You know, there's a history here. We we worked with the police department years ago to get the mm -hmm. right. uh, get the lights on late but at night. But there was yeah. no apartment house there at that time. I know, but it was the it. purpose. The intention mm -hmm. was to have a place for young people to go and mm -hmm. a safe right. place, right. And play yeah. basketball, and do something healthy. And right. and police were going to monitor it. So there was. Right. I think it, it's it's not black and white. Yeah, yeah, and the no. folks who live in the apartments moved it next door to a active high school. High school. High school with a basketball court. Right. Yeah, so but one certain. does not assume that basketball courts are going to be available till eleven o'clock at night. They're well, not saying shut it down. They're saying nine o'clock. No, well, that it was that was our plan several years ago. We put this plan in place, mm -hmm. working with the police department, to have it open till eleven o'clock mm -hmm. well, in the right. summer, so mm -hmm. that students. High school students, young people, mm -hmm. have a place to go that was safe. And it's, lit. It, the, 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 uh, the we're, the, we're, we're having okay. cross conversation, okay. which is okay. not appropriate at this time. And I think okay. that we've Fine. wandered She's through that part of the uh, the agenda. Why don't we get a, uh, the monthly financials? Could I just just a okay. couple okay. of quick things went on there because they weren't mm -hmm. big reports. Mm -hmm. Just a, uh, just a couple of things. Um, one has to do with the last day of school. I know here we are at the very beginning. <laughs> but it was in the advocate today talking about snow preparation. So it, it's important for people to understand that the last day of school right now on our calendar is June 29th. It could back up if we don't have five snow days. But it is June 29th, which means that the expectation for parents, and this will go out to parents as in an email fairly soon, um, is that they're in school to the 29th, mm -hmm. and that means they have to be planning it on camp accordingly. Mm -hmm. And the other is just really just more common for the school committee. Um, we've opened up the um, the files in mm -hmm. Novus on all the evidence on the goals from last year. So just want you to know that there's over mm -hmm. 600 pages at the moment, and more to come. Mm -hmm. So happy Thank reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've seen a lot of it anyway. So. 
It's just the noun categories that we talked about. That's all. Monthly financial reports. Okay. Um, well, I'm happy to say that we got the kindergarten grant, which we were completely not expecting last spring, and that was a lovely plus. Mm -hmm. um, we also saw a much higher Title I. In fact, most of our grants went up this year. Mm -hmm. um, wow. The little bit of bad news is that the DESE changed the way we can bill for tuition to end students and our ability to collect has been greatly reduced. And accordingly, I have reduced our expectation for collections to match what I think is a more conservative estimate. But even with that, we're coming out ahead of where we were. Um, and that's great. You didn't get a grant report this month because the grants don't really start till September 1st for the most part. And so that'll come back next month. Um, if you look at encumbrances, you'll see some of them are very high. Expenses like electricity and gas and other large ticket <coughs> items we encumber for the whole year. We do an estimate at this time of year, so it may look disproportionate. Also, instructional materials tend to be heavily purchased over the summer in advance of school. And so, you know, unlike other kinds of organizations, we don't spend in a steady way. We kind of bulge in the summer and then it tapers off. Um, but I think we look good so far. Mr. Hainer. I have only one line item, 81302. Okay, let me get that one open. And that would be in the Snow. general fund. Okay. Snow and ice. 81302. That is also. I'm just curious, did I miss the snowstorm? It's also storm stuff. Oh, That's okay. the code we use if okay. there's like a microburst and there's a tree that comes down. I just so saw we it. use it for emergency. Yeah, I, snow I and ice in the middle of July I, I, makes I no saw sense. Two hundred dollar expenditures, and I thought I missed the storm. Yeah, no, no. no we all, when we have mm -hmm. when we have other stuff, we also use it Thank for that. You. That's my only question. Doctor Seuss. Uh, so I know that our enrollment numbers are slightly higher than what we had anticipated. And I'm wondering if there were any extra spending as a result of those higher numbers. I apologize for the late presentation of this report, but it is the last item of the ones under um, my financial reports. It's called added positions not detailed in the budget. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. got it. So these are all the these are all the positions that we've added over the summer. Now, 11 FTEs. Um, totaling $726,000 were set aside in the budget explicitly for right. mm -hmm. players to be named later. Yeah. That was the eight general reserve positions, oh, okay. the one at the high school, and the two cluster expansion at the middle school. Mm -hmm. And so while we have exceeded that, in many cases when these add-on positions come in, they're, they're relatively more junior people and less mm -hmm. expensive. And when I budget, I use an average teacher's salary, and they generally are below that. So. Even though we had more, we've added more positions, and not all of the positions on this list are teachers. Some of them are teaching assistants, as you can see. Um, when all of that is factored in, um, we're actually right there when you okay. consider the additional grant funds okay. we've brought Thanks. in. So, you know, we're in touching wood. We are in great shape for this year. If we don't have any more elevator fiascos yeah, or a really, really, really bad winter, well, we made it through last winter okay. So, mm -hmm. hopefully, don't, no jinxing, but hopefully it looks good. <laughs> Consent agenda. Um, Thanks, Dan. The magic text. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There is no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, and in which the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of minutes, school committee regular meeting, May 28, June 11, 2015. Warrant for approval, June 11, 2015. Warrant. 15179 amount seven hundred thirty thousand three hundred ninety seven dollars and seventy five cents warrant for approval June 25th 2015 warrant 15186 total warrant amount one million two hundred three thousand eleven dollars and twenty eight cents warrant for approval July 16th 2015 effective June 30th warrant 16009 total amount two hundred ninety two thousand five hundred dollars and fifteen cents and warrant for approval, August 8, 2015, warrant number 16020, total warrant amount $450,181.34. Warrant for approval, August 27, 2015, warrant 16034, total warrant amount $735,347.69. Trip for approval, uh, NAFME, Tennessee National In-Service Conference, October 25th through 28th at the 
Gaylord Opryland Hotel. Uh, and thank you to all members who came in over the summer to sign those warrants. Uh, so move. I, Mr. Thielman? I got to pull the 11th. I left early that meeting. Okay. The minutes of the 11th. Pulling the, uh, absent the minutes of the of June 11th. Anything else? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Now a uh, motion for approval of the minutes of June 11th, 2015, so moved by Mr. Hainer, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Uh, abstain, Mr. Thielman. That concludes the um, consent agenda. Subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements, policies and procedures, Mr. Pierce. Uh, I'll be scheduling a meeting uh, with the members of that subcommittee to discuss what we talked about tonight, as well as those other things that we were going to plan to do for this year. Mm -hmm. Very soon. Uh, budget, Dr. Allison Appy. Budget met on June 22nd. Um, we discussed the last year's budget summary report book. Um, mm -hmm. In, with an eye to improve next mm -hmm. year's mm -hmm. um, and we came up with a number of suggestions um, the one which I want to bring up right now is that we after considerable discussion we the subcommittee felt that there was there it would be good to have a new section put in the book which is for the school committee to have a budget message mm -hmm. and we would include things like the calendar information about the visual budget and open checkbook, mm -hmm. um, information about the foundation budget and how it would affect things, the impact of cutting grants, um, just a place where we can talk about all these things that we think is important to the um, public and get this word out. I don't think we really need a motion for it, but we mm -hmm. wanted to tell you that's what mm -hmm. we were thinking of mm -hmm. and we're expecting the current budget subcommittee to write it Mm -hmm. and then it'll be passed on as we go to the next year. Good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Facilities, Ms. Starks. Uh, facilities met twice in August. Sorry, I'm going to try to move this closer. It doesn't really go that far. Um, met twice in August, first on August 12th, uh, where we met to discuss the Stratton, um, and uh, you can see the outcome of that, which is that the architects have laid out and placed uh, the Stratton, all of Stratton students in the modulars on the Stratton land. Mm -hmm. um, so mostly what we did was we got an update um, on that, on the renovation. Um, and uh, we also had our first look at the information from the enrollment study. Um, from this, we had decided that we needed to have a meeting in September, hence the September 24th meeting um, with all stakeholders and kind of everyone in town. Um, and so, as everyone knows, on September 24th, we'll have Dr. McKibben, um, I believe, and uh, well, Lori also will be there to talk about the different options, right, for how mm -hmm. we might deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, we also, at that time, got an update on a lot of the things that you also heard tonight, the Hardy Playground um, and uh, Spy Pond Field and the track, but we got all the answers mm -hmm. tonight, so they were all questions at that time. Um, on the 27th, we also had a facilities uh, subcommittee meeting. Um, this meeting was specifically to meet with Dr. McKibben about, uh, we had questions about the numbers in the enrollment study, not how we were going to solve any of the enrollment problems, but kind of just our internal questions mm -hmm. on how did you come up with the numbers, um, what are they telling you, you know, uh, what's going to happen after 10 years, your, your numbers end after 10 mm -hmm. years. Um, and so, uh, you know, mostly it was just so that we could get our head around the numbers mm -hmm. and really understand his uh, theory behind how he came up with them. Um, and so that was great. That was held at the high school. Um, and um, I think mm -hmm. most people saw today in the advocate mm -hmm. um, the information there, at least in my first mm -hmm. reading, was pretty accurate. Um, <laughs> Brackett, Hardy, and Thompson mm -hmm. um, are really the ones that mm -hmm. are going to take the biggest hit, according to uh, Dr. McKibben, uh, which will be followed closely by Audison in high school as all of those mm -hmm. uh, go through. Um, I think that the really interesting part about the meeting was that Dr. McKibben also said that um, it is very likely that his numbers are low. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes he comes in a little low. And um, that one of the things that he took into consideration, although we didn't see it in these numbers because it'll kind of happen after the 10 years, um, is that, that in about 10 years we're going to start seeing 
housing stock turnover, mm -hmm. and that's also going to cause what tends to happen in Arlington is older people sell their homes, younger people buy them, the younger people have children or bring children, um, and that starts another so boom cool. of children. So um, he did admit that that they're not in his numbers because his numbers only go out mm -hmm. for ten years, but the, that was when that was going to happen was mm -hmm. like the ten years after the report. So. Um, just something to keep in mind, although I don't want to be the bearer of horrible news. It's not horrible news. That's the other thing. It was interesting in the mm -hmm. advocate today because they not only had mm -hmm. the story on the report itself and mm -hmm. what we were seeing, but another complete story mm -hmm. by the, you know, where he interviewed a bunch of people, realtors mm -hmm. um, in town mm -hmm. who are like, mm -hmm. yeah, this doesn't shock us at all. <laughs> we knew exactly what was yeah. going on. You know, yeah. you guys are, you know, we are the... You know, this is what happens when you build a great town and, and the schools are strong mm -hmm. and the town is great and people want to live here. Mm -hmm. um, people are not surprised that this is happening. So mm -hmm. um, I just feel like we just have to keep it mm -hmm. in our minds that although it seems like right now it's a big problem, I don't think it's actually going to go away. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. we're um, kind of continuing to think about that. And mm -hmm. um, we do not currently have a meeting planned. We're waiting um, as uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Schlickman said after the 24th, mm -hmm. see what happens. Um, I have a feeling that from that meeting mm -hmm. there will be lots more facilities, mm -hmm. uh, subcommittee meetings, So, uh, but we don't mm -hmm. currently have a date for the next one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Seuss, Community Relations. Uh, yes, we had a meeting on Tuesday and um, we spent some time um, this summer sort of sorting through the survey results. Um, huge, mm -hmm. huge volumes of survey results. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, you know the, the information is all over the place. It's it's very mm -hmm. hard to figure out what's going on, but 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 it's mostly positive. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope to present something to the school committee in October. Excellent. Okay. Um, executive session minute review subcommittee special study group on superintendent evaluation and warrant committee. Mr. Heiner. I have uh, thanks to Ms. Fitzgerald. She gave us a, a form. I don't know if you two gentlemen have seen it. Uh, I, she gave me a pile of, uh, of executive session minutes that we have not released yet. I got to spend some wonderful minutes going through it. I filled out the form uh, with it, determining those, by my opinion, should be released, should not be released, mm -hmm. questions that may have to go. As soon as you two gentlemen get to it, we'll set up a meeting mm -hmm. and then uh, talk to council with mm -hmm. the ones that we have question on and then bring them forward uh, to the rest of the body. Excellent. Okay. Um, announcements from any members? Uh, oh, go I ahead. i got a couple more. Oh, okay. uh, the superintendent evaluation, uh, the survey, cover letter, and email addresses were delivered to Mr. Good. Uh, he and his team have worked very hard to try to get uh, this out. He's, mm -hmm. he's hit some uh, walls up and down. He still believes, mm -hmm. and hopefully he'll get it back to us, to the group, by uh, mid-September, no later than the end of September. Mm -hmm. uh, with that done, warrant committee, mm -hmm. uh, everyone get paid during the summer, as far mm -hmm. as I know. Mm -hmm. I signed all the warrants. Uh, CPAC met on Tuesday mm -hmm. uh, this week. Uh, Allison uh, mm -hmm. introduced yeah. her staff to parents, uh, mm -hmm. answered the, especially the new staff, and answered mm -hmm. a lot of questions. She did an excellent job. Their up count, up, upcoming calendar uh, on September 22nd at the Jefferson Cutter House will be the next meeting uh, at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, there will be a program for parents whose children will be turning 22 on October 7th. The location will to be announced. And um, let's see, the parents' basic rights meeting uh, will be on October 13th, uh, and that location uh, is to be announced at a later date. Hardy PTO will be meeting next Tuesday, September 15th at 6.30 in the evening. Thompson PTO welcome back breakfast next Tuesday, September 15th at 8.15 p.m. Thank you. Can I, I'd like to ask if there's some provision for CPAC to hold some meetings that are not during work hours for parents who might be interested? They have tried, they've asked, uh, they've set them up, mm -hmm. and nobody came. Uh, I, I will be happy to bring it for bring mm -hmm. it to them again. Uh, we've talked about it annually, and I think we'll give I, it, I was give asked it a shot. that I agree. Qu a question by a uh, by a special ed parent in the district. So. Absolutely, Mr. Thielman. Just one quick question: <clears throat> what well, you were talking about the evaluation of this, what, what's the timeline for reviewing your stuff? All the November to November. Mm -hmm. It's in November. Okay. Yep. I just want to refresh. Mm -hmm. that. Okay. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. I just have a question. When are we going to discuss the calendar and next year's start? 
that, that's a very good question. That question was raised by uh, uh, by correspondents today. Uh, that uh, uh, folks are already wondering if we're going to make significant adjustments to the calendar next year, and I think that uh, we, uh, in my response to to. Uh, uh, in the correspondence was that uh, we would do everything we can to make sure that notice was as far in advance as possible. So the question then becomes, when are we going to discuss this? Um, uh, Mr. Heiner. We also have some contractual uh, obligations to deal with. I recommend mm -hmm. the superintendent, maybe the AEA and mm -hmm. whoever else, uh, AEA, AAA, mm -hmm. deal with that first and then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. give us free latitude for discussing it. I'd say that we should have an idea of what our latitude is before mm -hmm. we make any conversation. And I'd say that for us, the window to make any adjustments next year would close pretty quickly because people want to know uh, yeah, to agree. make plans for next mm -hmm. year. Um, I, I, the, the chair would like to uh, uh, respond to one of the, uh, some of the correspondents and that we've received notification from a group is proposing a Great River Community Charter School, which would be a proposed 436 student K-8 school, uh, a regional district containing Medford, Everett, Arlington, Cambridge, and Winchester. Reading through the original correspondence from the group, which is not the full uh, application to the board, it's their initial offering, is that they want to establish a Waldorf school. Uh, we have a Waldorf school less than a mile from the Arlington town line in Lexington. Uh, the Waldorf school in Lexington charges a tuition of $20,561 plus a $495 materials fee. The <coughs> proposed charter Waldorf school would be paid for by the taxpayers of the uh, communities that send children so that if a child were to theoretically go from the Waldorf School in Lexington to the Waldorf School, uh, the Charter Waldorf School, if it is established, we would, t the tuition would be taken right off the top of our Chapter 78. Currently, in Fiscal 16, we have 11 Arlington students who are reported as preliminary enrollees in charter schools, three to the Benjamin Banneker K-6, six to the Community Charter School of Cambridge, which is a 6 through 12, and two to Prospect Hill Academy, which is a K-12. If any of those students were former Arlington students, or if the charter school did not exist, were to be in Arlington, uh, the chances are that it would have absolutely no impact on the budget, and certainly sending 11 children to these charter schools is not reducing the cost of operating the Arlington Public Schools, although it is costing us $158,378 to send them, uh, taken off the top of our Chapter 78. That's $14,398 for each student. I think it is incumbent upon us as a committee to contact the school committees in Medford, Everett, Cambridge, and Winchester, which are impacted by this region, uh, expressing our concerns about the proposal and uh, offering to work with them uh, to um, comment and hopefully persuade the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education not to approve it uh, with the consent <coughs> of the board uh, I would uh, draft a letter to present to this uh, <coughs> committee at the next meeting for your approval and then would send it to the four school committees with a copy to the State Board of El El Elementary and Secondary Education. Mr. Hainer. So moved. Second. Okay. <coughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Starks abstains. Um, but that's <coughs> what I intend to do. I'll present it to you at the next meeting. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Just ask the question. There was some talk. I, I don't know if it's going to. Be, are we going to have a regular meeting next, on the seventeenth? Do we mm -hmm. have any need for a regular meeting on the seventeenth? Because we won't have point? one until the first week in October. Right. In terms of any reports, no. But if there are some business items, what we could do on the twenty fourth um, is to have a short business meeting before the time mm -hmm. of the other meeting. Um, I don't think there's a problem with that. If there's some some 
a warrant you wanted to, you needed to approve. The, so I don't think there's any reports on my part that we would need to, to have a meeting on the 17th. Uh, I don't think there's anything actionable. If there is, we can, we can do some business at the end of the meeting as well. Um, so we're not meeting on the So 17th. we will not meet next <clears throat> Thursday. Okay. okay. Um, Thank you. But, uh, Dr. Bodie. Um, one question, though, is the time. I haven't sent out the invitation mm. because I want to know the time. Mm. And I think that that is mm. really a, an issue for the committee to decide. Most of the Permanent Town Building Committee mm. and the uh, selectmen don't meet till 7.30 mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Just the selectmen start at 7.15. 7.15. Permanent Town Building Committee is at mm -hmm. 7.30. I don't know when Capitol usually meets. Mm -hmm. They end at 7. They, yeah. And uh -huh. they have a meeting that night from 5 to 7. Oh. Ah, okay. So Ms. Starks. I would suggest that we start no later than 7 and that it goes from 7 to 9. I, I and think that, that way, if we have any business, we yeah. can meet 6.30. I, 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 would, I would take that as a motion to begin the meeting at 7. That's, yes. That sounds great. Uh, so, motion by Ms. Starks, second by Dr. Seuss. Uh, any discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And we will be meeting at Town Hall. Yes. So, so that so means just to it's seven o'clock at town hall. Uh, seven o'clock at town hall, and we will. But we might be meeting at six thirty. No, we we will start the meeting at seven. Uh, so six thirty, we're not meeting. Together. No, we're not meeting at six thirty. We'll start at seven, and any business we want to conduct, we'll do the at the conclusion of the meeting. Okay, great. Oh, okay. Seven's uh, perfect for mm -hmm. parents, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, you know, the thing is, is that if we start meeting earlier to have people assembling while we're meeting, I think is problematic. Yes. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. rather let them clear the hall for us to do routine business rather than have them assemble while we're meeting. That's good. Um, okay. Um, we have a need for executive session, mm -hmm. uh, after which we will adjourn, so uh, we will not be coming back oh, into open. Uh, will we be coming yeah. back to open session? Have to vote. Oh, we, we will have to make a vote in open session at the conclusion of the executive session. Um, um, so the motion will be uh, executive session, mo motion to conduct an executive Motion to conduct an executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union personnel in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining of litigation in which if held in open meeting may have a detrimental effect, collective bargaining may also be conducted. Uh, motion by Mr. Pierce, second by Dr. Okay. Seuss. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Aye. Mr. Pierce. Aye. Uh, Dr. Aye. Allison Ampey, Ms. Aye. Starks, Mr. Aye. Thielman, Dr. Seuss. The yes. chair votes aye. We are in executive session. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay. We are back in session after uh, an executive session. Um, for the record, it is also the 10th of September, it is 9 o'clock, and the membership is leaving here to go to the Patriots game at the conclusion of this meeting. So, Mr. Heiner, uh, the and first Mr. motion. In Mr. Schultzman's car. Uh, I move that the uh, Arlington Public uh, School Committee accept the, uh, approve the memorandum of agreement with the uh, AFSCME, bus drivers, yeah. for the bus drivers, AFSCME, local, AFSCME, local 680. 680. Uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Ms. Starks. Roll call. Mr. Hainer? Aye. Mr. Pierce? Aye. Ms. Aye. Allison Ampey? Dr. Allison Ampey. Uh, Ms. Starks? Aye. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Aye. And Dr. Seuss? Um, I'm going to stay in. Uh, I missed some of the discussion. I wasn't able to see it earlier. Uh, the chair votes in the affirmative. It's a 6 nothing, one vote. The uh, uh, motion is adopted. Mr. Hainer, next motion. I move that the Arlington School Committee uh, accept the approve. Thank you. Uh, the memorandum of agreement with the cafeteria workers. Members asked me six eighty. Uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Ms. Starks. Roll call, Mr. Hainer. Aye. Mr. Pierce. Aye. Dr. Allison Aye. Ampey. Ms. Starks. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Aye. Dr. Seuss. Yes. And the chair is voting in the affirmative. This is a seven to nothing vote. It is adopted, Mr. Hainer. I would like to publicly commend uh, Mr. Spiegel uh, for doing the phenomenal work he did this summer. And on yeah. our behalf. Aye, aye. 
Uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Ms. Starks. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? That's the unanimous vote. Mr. Hainer. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, second by Ms. Starks. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. We are adjourned. Go Pats. <laughs>